Overview and Principles of Neonatal Resuscitation, presented by Claire Barrett. Objectives. After review of this presentation, the learner will understand the changes in physiology that occur when a baby is born, identify the sequence of steps to follow during resuscitation, recognize the risk factors which help predict which babies will require resuscitation, Identify the equipment and personnel needed to resuscitate a newborn. Recognize the importance of communication and teamwork among team members during resuscitation. Important. Ventilation of the baby's lungs is the most important and effective action in neonatal resuscitation. Which babies require resuscitation? Approximately 10% of newborns require some assistance to begin breathing at birth. Fewer than 1% need extensive resuscitative measures to survive. Every birth should be attended by someone trained in initiating neonatal resuscitation. Additional personnel is needed when full resuscitation is required. Here we have an overview of a pyramid of resuscitative measures. At the top, you will see which is always needed by every newborn. We assess the baby's risk for resuscitation. We provide warmth. We position and clear the airway if necessary, and we always dry and stimulate. These three are needed less frequently. We give supplemental oxygen as required, assist ventilation with positive pressure, and intubation. And rarely needed are chest compressions and medications. ABCs of resuscitation. Airway. Ensure the airway is open and clear. Breathing. Be sure there is breathing, whether spontaneous or assisted. Stimulate the baby to breathe. Circulation. Make certain there is adequate circulation of the oxygenated blood. How does a baby receive oxygen before birth? Before birth, when the baby is still in utero, all oxygen the fetus uses crosses the placental membrane from the mother's blood to the baby's blood. Only a very small amount of fetal blood is passing through the fetal lungs. The fetal lungs are expanded in utero, but the alveoli are filled with fluid rather than air. The arterioles that are perfusing the lungs are constricted in part due to the low PO2 in the fetus. In fetal circulation, before birth, most of that blood from the right side of the heart is unable to enter the lungs due to the increased resistance to flow in the constricted blood vessels of those lungs. Most of the blood takes the lower resistance path and passes through the ductus arteriosus into the aorta. Now what happens when the baby takes their first breath? Fluid in the alveoli is absorbed into the pulmonary lymphatics and it's replaced by air. Air contains 21% oxygen, thus this oxygen diffuses into the blood vessels that surround the alveoli. Then we clamp the umbilical cord. The umbilical arteries constrict and then the umbilical arteries and vein are closed when the cord is clamped. This removes that low resistance placental circuit which then results in a rise in systemic blood pressure. Then as the alveoli are becoming distended with oxygen, the blood vessels in the lungs are now relaxing, decreasing their resistance to the blood flow, basically saying now you can come in. So the blood vessels in the lung tissue relax, decreasing the resistance to the blood flow. So we have, now that we have the decreased resistance, the lungs are allowing the blood to enter. Along with increased systemic blood pressure, we have a significant increase in the pulmonary blood flow and a decrease in blood flow through that ductus arteriosus. Therefore, now we have normal cardiac circulation occurring with oxygen from the alveoli being absorbed by the blood in the lungs and returning it to the left side of the heart where it's pumped out to the newborn's body. 
You want to be aware that although these initial steps and in transition occur within minutes after the baby's first cries and breaths, this entire process can take hours to days. For example, some studies show it takes up to 10 minutes of life for a newborn to achieve oxygen saturation greater than 90%. And functional closure of the ductus can take up to 12 to 24 hours, and complete relaxation of the lung vessels does not occur for months. So we can have some difficulties during transition. A baby may become distressed before labor, during labor, or at birth. In utero, before or during labor, usually is a sign of compromise in uterine or placental blood flow, which can be seen by fetal decelerations on the monitor. Difficulties after birth are related to problems with the airway or lungs of the newborn. Lungs may not fill with air when taking breaths. The ventilation is inadequate. The expected rise in blood pressure may not occur where you have hypotension with excessive blood loss, neonatal hypoxia or ischemia. Also, those pulmonary arterioles we talked about may remain constricted after birth from the lack of oxygen prior or during delivery. So when we have decreased blood flow to the lungs, we have inadequate oxygenation. And infants then will require resuscitation. So babies in distress. Depression of respiratory drive, poor muscle tone, bradycardia, tachypnea, persistent cyanosis, and hypotension. Here we have a video. It's a baby being born. He has poor respiratory drive, poor muscle tone, and cyanotic. After following the initial steps of providing warmth, stimulation by drying, and positioning the head to open the airway, the newborn starts to cry and shows improvement in color. We will discuss this further in the next slide. Steps in neonatal resuscitation. We have the initial assessment. Was the baby born at term? Is the baby breathing or crying? Does the baby have good tone? Yes, the infant stays with the mother. No, continue to the next step in resuscitation. Which is airway, block A. You want to provide warmth by covering the baby with a towel, placing skin to skin with mother. If the answer to any of those three previous questions was no, you want to place the infant on a warmer for further resuscitation. Position the head to open the airway. Clear the airway as necessary, which may require suctioning. You want to dry, stimulate the baby to breathe, and reposition the head to maintain an open airway. You should be evaluating the newborn during and following these interventions. You should take no more than 30 seconds to complete. Evaluate the respirations and the heart rate at the same time. If the infant is not breathing, apneic, or has a heart rate less than 100, you will proceed to positive pressure ventilation, which is the left side of block V on the algorithm. If the baby has a heart rate above 100, but still showing signs of compromise with labored respirations, persistent cyanosis, you would consider positive, continuous positive airway pressure CPAP, which is the right side of block B. So here we have breathing, block B. And you see on the left, if the infant is not breathing, apneic, or has a heart rate less than 100, you'll proceed to positive pressure ventilation. If the heart rate is above 100, but showing signs of compromise with the labor respirations and persistent cyanosis. You will be on the right side, administering CPAP. You want to note that after initiating any type of respiratory support, whether it's the PPV or CPAP, you should place a pulse oximeter on the infant to determine the need for supplemental oxygen. After about 30 seconds of PPV or CPAP, you want to evaluate again to make sure your ventilation is adequate. Important again, effective ventilation is, the cr is critical before you move on to the next steps in resuscitation. In most all cases, appropriate ventilation will cause a rise in heart rate above 100. However, 
If the heart rate is below 60, you want to proceed to circulation, which is block C, chest compressions. When you begin chest compressions, intubation is strongly recommended. After administering a cycle of chest compressions and positive pressure ventilation, you want to evaluate the infant again. If the heart rate is still below 60, despite ventilation and chest compressions, you want to proceed to block D, which is drug. If you administer epinephrine as you continue positive pressure ventilation and chest compression. If the heart rate continues below 60, chest compressions and administration of epinephrine is repeated. If the heart rate rises above 60 beats per minute, chest compressions are stopped and positive pressure ventilation continues until the heart rate is above 100 and the baby is breathing. Supplemental oxygen can be administered based on the oxygen saturation. Here we have the complete algorithm. We start at birth, asking the questions, is the baby term gestation, breathing or crying with good tone? The answer is yes, stay with the mother and provide routine care. If the answer is no, you want to warm, cure the airway if necessary, dry and stimulate. And here, if your heart rate is below 100, the baby is gassing or apneic, you want to do positive pressure ventilation and put on the full socks. If the answer is no, but you still have labor breathing or persistent cyanosis, you would want to do CPAP and put on the pulse sock. So for below 100, we're doing positive pressure ventilation and we continue with a heart rate below 100. You want to take corrective ventilation steps. Make sure you're adequately ventilating. If your heart rate is below 60, now you want to consider intubation, start your chest compressions. Coordinate that with positive pressure ventilation. If your heart rate is now still below 60, you want to administer the IV epinephrine and repeat the cycle as necessary until you again have that rise above 60 or 100. Some risk factors to be aware of for babies that need resuscitation. Risk factors are, are helpful, however, some babies with no risk factors will still need resuscitation, so always be prepared to resuscitate all babies. The resuscitation team. At delivery, there should be at least one skilled person immediately assigned to the baby. The baby should be this person's sole responsibility. The assigned person should be capable of initiating a resuscitation um, and be capable of administering positive pressure ventilation and chest compression. This person or another person skilled in complete resuscitation, including intubation and administration of medication should be immediately available. On-call personnel is not appropriate in newborn resuscitations. There should always be someone available and ready to respond. In anticipated high-risk deliveries, at least two people should be assigned to manage resuscitation of the baby. One person with complete resuscitation skills and one or more people to assist. Teamwork, leadership, and communication are critical to neonatal resuscitation. Working under intense time and pressure requires effective communication and coordination with other team members. Several key factors can help. Know your environment, anticipate a plan, assign a leader, use all available information and resources, Call for help when needed and always maintain professional behavior.